You're listening to TIP. On today's show, we're really thrilled to bring you our interview with quant investor, Dr. Wesley Gray. Dr. Gray is the founder of the Alpha Architect and is also a contributor at the Wall Street Journal. We've had Wes on the show numerous times, and in the past, we always receive such positive feedback from members of our audience about the discussions that we have with him. And on today's show with Wes, we're talking about artificial intelligence and what impacts it might have in the financial management world. Additionally, Wes talks to us about the current market conditions and how he's currently positioning himself based on the fundamental and momentum indicators that Wes uses. So without further delay, here's our interview with the talented Dr. Wesley Gray. You are listening to The Investor's Podcast, where we study the financial markets and read the books that influence self-made billionaires the most. We keep you informed and prepared for the unexpected. All right. Welcome to the Investor's Podcast. Uh, We're thrilled to have you with us today. And like we said in the introduction, we have Wes Gray here with us. So Wes, welcome back to the show. Thrilled to have you. I appreciate you putting the time in. So Wes, I want to start off the conversation talking about a thing that Stig and I have been doing a lot of research on lately, and that's Mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. I'm digging around on the internet. I'm scrounging for research papers and whatnot. And I just keep coming up to the same website talking about artificial intelligence and investing. And it's Mm -hmm. your website. It's Alpha Architect. Almost every hit that I get for any type of search that I'm doing that involves deep learning, machine learning, neural networks meshed with any type of investing, I'm getting hits on your site. So I know you guys are doing a lot of research in this area. I'm just curious from an overall point of view, how do you see AI interacting with investing? What do you see this progressing to in the coming five to 10 years? And I know if you guys are doing anything proprietary, we obviously want to respect that. But if you can talk Mm -hmm. to us about what you guys are up to, let us know. I'm like you. I'm trying to learn as fast and rapidly as I can. So what we're doing is we're partnering up with a lot of other folks that are got more knowledge in the space than myself. So we, we've got a lot of smart people. And then another thing I recommend people read, I actually got the book right here called AIQ. I like it because it's highly accessible in the sense that it's not like a bunch of math equations and Python code. Professor Paulson was always very open about being a great teacher. So I think his book does a good job of saying, hey, these are the high-level concepts of what this thing is trying to solve. All that said, all this excitement, honestly, I think people should be very careful because a lot of this is marketing. We have not found any evidence, at least in the context of long-term investment strategies where long term is let's say monthly rebounds which for many is pretty damn short that suggests that it's adds any value beyond what are kind of common known things like buy cheap stocks buy momentum stocks etc that's not to be closed minded to say that it can't add value but no one has shown to us beyond any definitive doubt that it would be worth adding from an evidence based standpoint Whereas I do understand that a lot of people are saying, well, yeah, it's great marketing, but we try to avoid being about marketing, trying to be about you know transparency, evidence-based and all this stuff. So to be frank, exciting, but haven't found any useful applications thus far, to be completely honest. So Wes, would that be because you only have a very limited amount of data? I mean, most AI funds, they're really, really new. Is that why you haven't found anything or is it because of different factors where you, at least for now, can conclude that it does not have a significant impact? What we found is relative to known technologies already out there, it's very hard to differentiate and say, oh, this adds so much additional value after considering the complexity, the black boxness and the inability to truly understand Let's say you got a strategy that makes whatever 10% a year, you know, having back tested and, you know, memorized these databases at this point, it's so much noise and little things matter so much. Something like that is not going to move the needle one way or the other. Now, the big issue also is the level of frequency. We're kind of more long term, low frequency investors, and there's just only so much data in samples out there, right? So I don't even know if you could ever definitively, quote unquote, prove to yourself 
then machine learning was working given the, the history of docs. I, where I do think it could be more useful, and I know it's in, in more application, is in super high frequency where there's a ton of like data and there's tons of resolution. We got we, we take all the data in, tomorrow this is resolved because we know if we won or lost. And, and so I think there it probably has more application. Now, I don't want to confuse the audience here with what I'm saying. The book that Wes recommended was AIQ. Now we're going to talk about, I was curious if you've seen this ETF ticker called AIEQ and if you have any thoughts on it, because so far it's been outperforming the market since its inception, but it's only been on the market for, it's coming up on a year here pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. So I figure you might ask a question about that because I, I know you guys had the gentleman on your podcast recently that runs it. And, and that was, by the way, a fascinating conversation. And there's nothing against what they're doing. Again, we're looking at it and, and want to understand it as well. But here's the thing. If you look at our stuff this past year today, especially like our momentum fund, we're also destroying the market. We've also been destroyed in the past. We've just had a lot more time and grade than they have. They actually move very similarly and we're actually beating them. And that's not to say that we're that great. It's just to say that controlling for known things like concentrated momentum investing, it kicked ass this last year. But we don't have like 10,000 data points and we're not fueled by you know IBM Watson. I don't think that there's reason to be super excited with AIEQ based on the performance. Because I think it's really just their factor tilt or probably explaining a lot of what they're doing. It's always important to dig in the weeds because just because you beat the market over any given time period, especially short window, that's pretty easy to do. Just depending on what the characteristics of your portfolio look like and how those characteristics perform. Yeah, it's a very interesting point. And what's going to happen when you see a seasons change and you know all stocks are going to drop? Uh, what's going to happen with these AI stock picks? You know, looking at the some of the holdings they have, it kind of looks like momentum picks. And as you mentioned before, momentum has been really strong here recently, has really been outperforming. Could you also mention the stock ticker for the fund that you're running in terms of momentum and then perhaps people can even compare? Um, sure. So what I recommend is just go to our uh, ETF website, ETFsite.alphaarchitect.com. We generally refrain from talking about our own tickers for Compliance reasons on here, but if you just Google it and type in Momentum Alpha Architect, it, you'll be able to find out about it. Not a problem. Awesome. How do you think about volatility in a momentum strategy? What I've noticed as I'm trying to implement momentum, and I'm obviously not the best momentum guy, but mm-hmm. what I've noticed is when I find something that has a very low volatility, yep. but has the same momentum qualities of something that doesn't have so much volatility, that is a huge benefit for me. And I'm kind of curious how you guys view volatility when you're trading momentum. People should always consider the, the beta or, or the volatility whenever they're doing momentum because it, it just, you know, stepping back and thinking about it, if you're just in a market with tons of raging stocks, i.e. like right now or maybe like the last few years, by nature, all the high momentum names are just going to be the most volatile, most risky because they paid off the best, right? So what a lot of people will do is there's a thing called like alpha risk adjusted momentum. So they'll look at all stocks, but then they'll control for their market beta, controlling for market exposure in your sense, essentially saying, hey, like low ball that also has a similar momentum general that seems to be a more effective way of picking momentum stocks in particular you know we wrote a whole book about this and there's you looked at every single you know scheme out there is we use an algorithm called frog in the pan and the frog in the pan algorithm is essentially saying hey and the reason it's called frog in the pan is we want to look for this slow boiling momentum not like the spiky momentum so i.e we kind of like this more low vol momentum, not like the biotech goes up 100% today type momentum. It's called frog in the pan. And really, anything that captures that idea, if you've got high momentum, but the path to get there was you dip the frog in the cold water and you slowly turn them up and he gets cooked in the end, that's the better type of momentum that, that you want, at least empirically, it seems to work better uh, from an investment standpoint. That's what I was hoping you were going to say, and I'm glad you did. <laughs> yeah, and it, just a caveat. It's not that, that like anything, it, it's noisy, doesn't work all the time. And, and when I say it, quote unquote, works, I mean, 
you know, on hammering on every market we could find over super long periods, on average, it has an edge relative to just generic momentum strategies. But I would just like to reiterate, when every time you say something works in investing, it means it works over long periods with small edge. It's not like the day trading strategy will make you a, a private island owner, fortunately. I've got a question for you. We saw the market hit a huge top. It was like going parabolic back in January of 2018, and then it had a really abrupt correction. S&P 500 comes down, hits the 200-day moving average, kind of bounces around at that level, and then has mm-hmm. slowly started to recover off of that 200-day moving average. As a momentum investor, I'm just kind of curious how you guys were viewing this event back then. And yep. how close were you to liquidating some of your positions? Because from a fundamental mm-hmm. standpoint, we all know this thing's screaming high right now. But from a momentum standpoint, I know you're kind of like, hey, if, mm-hmm. it, if the momentum's good, I'm just going to continue to hold until that changes. So I'm really curious how you guys were viewing this event back then. And were you guys kind of getting a little bit on edge? So I don't get on edge because I have computers worry about that for me. So I don't have to get emotional about anything. We weren't that concern because we're using 12 month uh, moving average and 12 month what they call time series. We were always still pretty far away from those. If you were in the 10 month, 200 day range, your feet were getting a little bit on fire there. To be frank, I don't know if that one triggered, but I know our stuff was, was pretty far away. Yeah, we weren't worried about it. Now that said, international markets have been way rockier than US markets. And we actually did hedge a little bit couple months ago, pulled it back off, and now we're potentially going to put it back on. So we are in the phase right now, at least on international markets, where we are either have been hedged or about to be hedged again, and we want to start probably pulling some of that market risk off there. But the U.S., it's long and strong. Which international markets are talking about here? I'm actually talking just all of them. I'm talking EFI specifically, so like international develop. If you look at all of them, like develop, China. I mean, any of the international markets, it's been a much rockier road than obviously uh, U.S. equity has been. So that's just, you know, trend falling is starting to, you know, matter a little bit out there. We're here in the States. I mean, we're just riding this Trump wave, I guess. I would like to continue talking about this concept then in association with inflation. You know, whenever we look at inflation, at least by the conventional metrics, you know, you have your basket of various goods that you would need in your household, energy, and so on and so forth. Uh, If we look at those metrics, it seems like inflation has barely moved. And on the other hand, then we have something like quantitative easing, where you would go in and supply the system with a lot of cash. Basically, bonds would be replaced with cash, and that cash would be pumped into the system a lot of that into the equities market. So I guess this is my long-winded way of asking you, how do you see this relationship here? Do you see this as quantitative easing having an impact on inflation, just not the inflation that it's getting reported? Honestly, I used to think I knew about this stuff. Frankly, I have no clue. But I will tell you a story. You know, I'm a University of Chicago, Milton Friedman, Bible thumper here. So I'm a free market. It's like, I believe in his idea, or used to, that, hey, if you print a bunch of money and do a bunch of stuff, eventually someone's going to pay the piper in the form of price inflation. And of course, 08 comes around and they're printing money like tailors. My intuition was like, holy cow, we're going to have inflation. And of course, in normal price inflation indexes, to your point, we haven't seen that. A lot of people say, well, they printed money, but it stayed in the bank, etc. But they also in- inherently kept basically the risk-free, the hurdle rate way low. So it encouraged people to invest in risk assets so they could get a premium, which embedded in kind of an asset inflation. Now, here's the thing. Whether it's in asset inflation or where it is, in the end, like too few dollars chasing too few goods. I would still expect it, according to the old theories, to be in PI type metrics. And I think this is almost a narrative that we've somehow backed in. Oh, well, it went into assets. But I don't know of any theory or any macro communications out there that explain how this story ends. I agree with the narrative there, but I just don't have any clue on the dynamics of how that plays out in the future. 
Yeah, that makes two of us. <laughs> all you got to do is look at all the, the Chicago guys come out of 08. You know, everyone with that New York Times guy, Krugman, he was explaining at the time, no, this will not end up in inflation. You guys are all wrong. You're not thinking about this, right? And and he was getting blown off the mountain. All my Chicago guys were just saying, you're an idiot. You know, we're all screwed. And they were all wrong. And so, again, I, I kind of got mentally screwed up there because my old mental model obviously didn't explain the world that well. And so I'm still learning myself here, man. I'm trying to figure it out on, on how this all plays out, to be completely honest. So let's say we go through another cycle and we fast forward years in, in the future here and we go through another credit cycle. They obviously turn right back to the QE again. Well, we know we can't say with 100 percent confidence, but I think yeah. we can say with quite a bit of confidence that if we do more QE, it's going to drop interest rates lower because of somebody buying at any price, really, in the bond market. Yeah. So, at least in the short side of the treasury market. Yeah, well, and I think even in this last credit cycle, we saw them, the operation twist where they were buying even outside of the short end of the cycle. Yeah. And I think that that's really kind of the play during the next credit cycle yeah. is that they're going to extend themselves, not just at the federal funds rate, but they're going to actually go out on the longer end of the bond yield curve. When they do that, what we're seeing is that they're replacing credit with hard currency. And you can continue to do that as long as you're doing kind of this one for one swap where you're taking hard cash and you're replacing it with credit. But once you have exchanged all of that and now you're trying to manufacture growth through manipulation of the currency is really what's happening. I think you would agree with yeah. that. That's where I think you might start to see the inflation go crazy if all of that would continue to play out and if what I just described is tools that are used. I think that's yeah. where you could potentially see it. But I think why Krugman was right on this last credit cycle is because mm -hmm. it was kind of a one-for-one -one swap with the hard currency for the credit that it was replacing. One thing that I am fascinated about, you look out there, the term structure right now, it's crazy. The 30-year, the 10-year versus the two-year, they're about the same. It seems like market participants, and I do not believe that the federal government has enough clout to control like well in the 30-year. And it's basically saying that expected inflation for the next gazillion years is not that high. And that's just really perplexing to me because I just can't believe that it seems like the economy is on fire and they're doing a lot of things like policy wise, or even if the president's kind of a little bit out there, uh, like from a PR perspective, like from a straight economic policy, you know, outside of the trade war stuff, lower taxes, lower regulation. We see it in our business. It just seems like this sucker's raging. And like everyone I talk to that's a business person is like, dude, this thing is awesome. So if you got raging economy and somehow, somewhere, all this inflation and fake money and printed dollars were put out there somewhere, it seems to me like it's got to get rocking here at some point. But again, my old mental model of how the world works, I'm kind of naturally like a gold guy. Like I would like to have just know that my dollar is worth X. Now, if you look at Japan, you know, they might be 10 or 20 years ahead of us in terms of a long-term cycle. And if you look at their inflation numbers, I mean, they've been so low. I think back in 2014, for a brief period of time, it shot over 2%. But, you know, it's been zero, sub-zero. It's just been, it's been outrageous. And they're not just buying up the bond market. Now they're starting to buy up the equities market. That's a perfect example where how many hedge fund graveyards have been dug by being short the freaking JGB. So many. I've seen so many smart pitches over the years. And all these people are just face down in a grave right now. Got their face ripped off. Have that mental model of like print money, tons of debt. Eventually, inflation monsters will be here. It just doesn't happen. But I think the key difference is we've got something different. We've got a ripping, raging, dynamic economy on the cusp of potentially happening here. Where, whereas Japan kind of went from like a pinnacle monster asset bubble that blew them out. They were never able to recover from an economic point, I don't think. Whereas here, we could have, we probably have a monster asset bubble. But I think we have a lot of like real growth and real change that is generating like real GDP, which could put us back in the inflation potential camp versus like 
20, 30 years from now, we're like sitting on CPI of 10 bips or whatever. So who knows? We'll find out. It would be an interesting experiment. I mean, the great thing about your strategy is you could be dead wrong about that and you'd probably still make money because you're following the momentum and you're following the trend. If it tells you something different than what your thesis is telling you, you go with what the trend and yeah. the momentum's telling you. No, it, you got it, man. Like The great irony is prices tell you everything and usually have the wisdom of the crowds embedded in them, even if it's entirely against your narrative. So if the prices on bonds start ripping, i.e. yields start going way up, freaking get short that damn thing. Or likewise, similarly, if bond prices start going way up, way up, way up, and yields start coming down, even though I believe inflation is imminent, I don't care. I'm going to get long bonds. And that, that's why I just love about trend falling is that you no longer have to rely on what you want. You just follow what the market is telling you. And it feels to me like relying on what the market thinks a lot of times is a lot smarter than relying on what your monkey brain thinks because you know, narrative and story is so powerful and it's usually wrong. So is the process more that you would find undervalued stocks and then find the right momentum or is it are you looking at momentum and then see if some of those momentum stocks also are undervalued? I start with the idea that I don't know. So I barbell it, right? Like I buy cheap, nasty value stock, things like Kohl's or Macy's or whatever, total dirtball, meaner version trade. And I say, great, that's my religion. That's my story. And that's something I could do. It, you know, I died. No problem there. But I also recognize that a lot of these things seem rolled by Amazon. So on my other hand, I got momentum. So I'm just buying the highest flyers out there, you know, the divergence trade. So on one hand, I got the mean reversion trade, but I'm coupling that in a barbell with, you know, the non-mean reversion trade, the momentum trade. You want to pull those together. You kind of can win either way. If you knew exactly which one was going to work, well, obviously you'd pick that. But you know, name me the guy who has a genie in their bottle that can tell them what the future is going to hold. No one can. So I'm just going to hold the best of both. And then as far as like managing beta or managing, you know, my overall market risk, I'm going to use trend falling on that. So if, if risk is paying off and I see that in price trends, own it. If it's not, get flat. I don't call it buy and hold. I call it buy and suffer, which is great if you've got the ability to do that. But if there's a way to kind of sidestep the suffering and it seems somewhat reasonable, why not do that? Yeah, I'm just a trend follower, man. And, and then on stock pickings, I like mean reversion. I also like momentum. And I just pull them together because I just don't know. So it's really about placing your bets. You have the different buckets out there, knowing full well that one of them probably is not going to work maybe. But that's why you diversify across concepts. Right now is 30 August 2018. So what we're about to talk about is pretty specific to when we recorded this. But right now, what are some of the trend following and momentum areas that you like? You mean as far as like where, where are the trends? Yeah. Right now? Like what would you say are some of the strongest trends that are going right now? Really what you got right now is, you know, U.S. equity, obviously, a lot of things are mixed. So like the bond complex has been kind of whips on around. Right now, you're, if you're a short-term trend on the bond, like the 10-year complex across the globe, you're generally long. Commodity complex is kind of mixed. Like metals, you're generally short. So a lot of the energy sector, you know, you're generally long. But that's starting to change as well. So I would say across the board, outside of U.S. equity, and it's just a broad-based statement, it's kind of whips on around and mixed, but that's why you trend fall. Like eventually some trend will probably emerge here. It's just for the most part, we, you know, we haven't been in any great positive trends. And the only thing you're starting to see now is big negative trends. And one example I, I was telling you about there is like international equity. Like that's something where a lot of storms are out there brewing and you're seeing that in price action. So, that, so that'd be a market if you believed in trend falling you might want to start de-risking or at least watching where those price actions going and take your risk gingerly. Hey, uh, the one thing I wanted to talk about, Wes, last year at this time, I participated in this amazing event that you put on. I had the pleasure of hanging out with Ted and Patrick O'Shaughnessy and yourself and many others 
For people that don't know, Wes is a former Marine and once a year, him and Jack Bogle and some other folks there at Alpha Architect put together this event in coordination with Pennsylvania National Guard. They go out, they get a barracks. Okay. So I show up and there's Drill Sergeant Gray bossing everybody through the open bays. We're all sleeping in open bays. We're all eating chow together. And then we go out and we do this massive hike, 28 miles. Let me tell you what an event. Wes is doing it again. Unfortunately, I am not able to go this year. I was going to be there and then my schedule changed a little bit and I wasn't able to pull it off. But Wes, what's the dates for this year? So it's Marshall Fawn. A lot of people just know this is not a charity event at all. Not going to ask you for money. We float all the chow, all the lodging. You just got to show up. This is a living memorial, you know, represent and be able to look at Gold Star family in the a gold star family, people don't know, is someone who had a son or daughter who was killed in action. You know, let them know that we still remember. So, you know, so this is something that's about like living memorials. So that's your charity is showing up. It's basically the 29th of September. So the plan, though, is you show up the 28th, that Friday, and we do some tribal bonding, got some chow, we got some speakers this year. But you can do five miles, you can do 10 miles. I can tell you personally, this was just an amazing event. The people that are there are amazing, but really the mission of why you're going there and what you're doing. Every mile marker, they had a soldier who had lost his life or her life. It was just amazing to go. And every time you passed another mile, you put your hand on the picture, you keep going. Just an amazing event, the way that they have it all structured. So I can't promote this enough. If you are wanting to know more about this, we're going to have a link in our show notes. You can click on that and where you can sign up. And then Wes will take it from there. Once you're signed up, you'll start getting emails on prep, what to do to train, all sorts of things. Because if you're going to do the whole thing, this is no walk in the park. It's quite intensive. But like Wes said, if you want to go out there, hang out with some people, just do five miles. You can do five miles. It doesn't matter. No one's judging you or anything. But I can attest to how awesome the experience is. So we'll have the information on our show notes for that. Awesome. Wes... Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come on the show. You always willingly say yes, even though I know you're very busy and we just really appreciate that because you always give us so much information to think about. So thanks for your time, Wes. Thank you. I, I mean, I, our mission is empowered through education and I love what you guys are doing. And, and honestly, you guys are probably one of my favorite podcasts. But yeah, I love what you guys do, man. Keep it up and keep educating and people should tune in and tell their friends about the podcast. Thanks, Wes. You got it. All right, guys. That was all that Preston and I had for this week's episode of the Investors Podcast. We see each other again next week. Thanks for listening to TIP. To access the show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. To get your questions played on the show, go to asktheinvestors.com and win a free subscription to any of our courses on TIP Academy. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making investment decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the TIP Network. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. 